When my parents first found out that they were having a baby in 2006, they experienced all the excitement that comes with expecting a child. All parents can relate to the natural questions that came up as they dreamt about this new little human. What would they be like? Whose eyes and nose would they have? What would they like to do? What would their sense of humor be like? My parents got their first surprise far before their due date. At the first trimester ultrasound, they found out that they were having twins. And so in February of 2007, they happily welcomed me and my sister into the world. The answers to all the questions they had asked themselves were finally revealed day by day as we grew up. This was just 17 years ago, but this story is very different from the one parents might experience today. Thanks to a new technology called CRISPR, the curiosity and mystery that comes with pregnancy may never be what it once was. CRISPR has the potential to completely change the way that we view the production of human life. It's our responsibility to ask ourselves whether or not this is a good thing. So what is CRISPR? It's actually an acronym that stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. The complex biology behind CRISPR deserves a talk in and of itself, but I'm gonna keep my description brief in the interest of focusing on the ethical and historical side today. Basically, scientists discovered certain proteins that can be engineered to precisely cut and insert DNA sequences. They realized it was theoretically possible to use these CRISPR systems to insert, subtract, and change genes in any part of the human genome. Obviously, this amazing tool comes with a myriad of social and ethical complications. Just because we have the ability to edit genes, does that mean we should? There's a lot to consider. On one hand, there's therapeutic gene editing, which is entity editing that aims to improve health by addressing a genetic disease. For example, sickle cell anemia is a disease caused by a DNA mutation that leads to the production of sickle-shaped blood cells. People with this disease suffer from episodes of severe pain, frequent infections, and delayed growth. It's dangerous and extremely painful. Many would say that using CRISPR to fix the mutation and cure the sickle cell patient is ethical. But what about a disease like Down syndrome? Some might assume that Down syndrome automatically means a bad or unfulfilled life, but the very opposite may be true. In a recent survey of people with Down syndrome, 99% said they were happy with their lives, 97% said they're happy with who they are, and 96% like how they look. So who are we to judge the quality of life of a person with a disease we've never experienced? And how do we draw the line between diseases that should be corrected and those that shouldn't? On the other hand, CRISPR can be used non-therapeutically to select non-health-related traits. This is where we get the term designer baby, a baby whose genetic makeup has in some way been altered or selected for non-medical reasons. With CRISPR, it's now theoretically possible to change genes in any part of the human genome before implantation. This could mean selecting for superficial traits, such as eye color, skin color, height, hair texture, low risk for baldness, and 20-20 vision. There's also been discussion of editing for other more complicated traits, things like intelligence and creativity, friendliness, and charisma. CRISPR could also be used to develop babies with special talents by selecting genes for athleticism or perfect pitch. For some people, this whole concept seems strangely dystopian. For all of human history, pregnancy has come along with speculation over what the baby would be like. Parents didn't know what they were getting. Now with CRISPR, the process of having a baby may be on its way to becoming more like the purchase of a product. So many concerns come up as we creep towards this type of editing. For people who are religious, this all might feel a little like playing God. Is it okay for us to be engineering human life? Personal identity is also a concern. What if a kid that was quote unquote bred to be an athlete actually prefers something else? How does that impact a person's self-esteem? Finally, there's the question of equality and how all of this will play out in the real world. A baby won't stay a baby forever. They'll grow up and have to interact with society. Issues quickly arise over the way society will treat people depending on traits they were edited to have. We're essentially approaching a point where we can create people who are in some way superior to others. In a world that's already riddled with inequality and oppression, is this really a good idea? In order to better understand the potential dangers ahead, we need to look back in history. In the 1880s, a British anthropologist named Francis Galton had the idea to artificially select human traits. Inspired by Darwin's theory of natural selection, Galton proposed that only people with the best genes should be able to have children, and the rest of the population shouldn't breed, so that the human race could be purified. The whole thing, of course, was colored by extremely prejudiced notions of race, class, and gender, but it took off. 
and Galton named his idea eugenics for the Latin word meaning good in stock. The idea of eugenics spread to America where it quickly gained traction. And no story better embodies the eugenics movement than that of Carrie Buck. Carrie Buck was born in 1906 to a poor family in Virginia. Orphaned at a young age, she spent most of her childhood in foster care, but she was still a relatively normal child who sang in her church choir and earned average grades in school. When she was 17, however, Carrie was raped by a member of her foster family and became pregnant. In an effort to curb the embarrassment, her foster family brought Carrie in front of the judge, who was a friend of theirs, hoping to get rid of Carrie by designating her as feeble-minded. Feeble-minded isn't a phrase that we're used to hearing today, but in the early 1900s, it was a widely accepted classification term. In fact, the same is true for the words idiot, moron, and imbecile. This is a pamphlet issued by the Virginia State Board of Charities and Corrections that displays the hierarchy of mental classifications used at the time. It may be odd to see terms here that we use much more casually today, but these were all used by the government. And although they were all given official psychiatric definitions, in practice, they were vague, widely encompassing umbrellas meant to cover people whose appearance, behavior, or situation fell outside of the accepted societal norms, from prostitutes and orphans to feminists and people with dyslexia. As we'll see in a moment, the assignment of these terms was often used arbitrarily to justify social exclusion, imprisonment, and sterilization. So once Carrie was deemed feeble-minded by the judge, she was shipped off to the Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded, which basically functioned as a prison for women deemed genetically inferior. Unfortunately for her, Carrie arrived at the colony just as eugenics advocates were seeking a blanket legal order to authorize the sexual sterilization of people on eugenics grounds. And Carrie was selected for a test case. If the courts would approve her sterilization, it would set the standard for eugenic sterilization going forward. Carrie's case, Buck v. Bell, was argued in front of the United States Supreme Court in 1927. The eugenicist's main goal was to show a trend of inferiority among multiple generations of Carrie's family so that they could argue that women like Carrie shouldn't be allowed to add to the population. To do this, they highlighted the fact that Carrie's mother, Emma, had had a record of vagrancy and prostitution. As for Carrie, a district nurse testified that she'd been caught, quote, writing notes to boys as an example of her problematic behavior. And when it came to Carrie's infant daughter, Vivian, the one she'd had after being raped, a social worker who was sent to observe the eight-month-old testified that, quote, there's a look about it that is not quite normal, but just what it is, I can't tell. It was on this murky evidence that the Supreme Court decided eight to one that Virginia sterilization laws were in fact constitutional. According to the court, sterilizing women like Carrie was necessary in order to keep the country from being swamped with incompetence. Of the Bucks, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. famously remarked in the majority opinion that, quote, three generations of imbeciles is enough. With this decision, the Supreme Court authorized the sterilization of 70,000 Americans. It's important to note that classism played a huge role in this system. Poor people of all kinds were much more likely to be targeted, and it was a fear of the lower class that drove a kind of hysteria that fueled the sterilization movement. There's no real evidence that Carrie Buck was deficient in any way. Her fatal flaw was being poor, illiterate, and powerless. In the same way, racism and anti-immigrant sentiment led to people of color and immigrants being disproportionately targeted for sterilization. So as this whole movement was taking off in the US, certain European leaders took an interest. And while he was in prison in the early 1920s, none other than Adolf Hitler read about eugenics. And the idea that defective genes of inferior people were poisoning his country really resonated with him. So in the 1930s, when the Nazi party rose to power, one of his first steps was to put in place a national sterilization program targeting Jewish people. After sterilization came isolation and then concentration camps. What happened next, of course, was one of the biggest tragedies in world history, the systemic state-sponsored genocide known as the Holocaust. Six million Jewish people and an unknown number of others were mass murdered. So what does this have to do with what's going on today? As Americans, we like to think of the Holocaust as a horrific but foreign event, something that could never happen here. But is that true? 
the very leaders who mass murdered millions in Germany took inspiration from a movement that happened right here in this country. And although this is a really hard history, it's important to reflect honestly on the mistakes of the past in order to prevent them from occurring. Just like the scientists and policymakers who contemplated eugenics in the 1900s, we're approaching a slippery slope. However, because of amazing technology, a lot of potential for positive change is on the horizon. CRISPR has the power to ease human suffering in a completely unprecedented way. However, the same technology has the power to worsen the already existing inequality in our society and exacerbate the oppression of the weakest among us. The same classism, racism, and xenophobia that was present during the eugenics movement could absolutely drive the way CRISPR is used. And creating people who are genetically superior would likely favor those who already have the biggest advantages in our society. We've already failed once in an endeavor to change our gene pool. We can't afford to make the same mistakes again. So what does this have to do with all of you? When I think about the eugenics movement, both here and abroad, as well as the Holocaust, the scariest part isn't even the horrific actions of the powerful few at the top. What's even scarier is that millions and millions of ordinary people were convinced that what was happening was okay and that their country was doing a service for themselves and for the world. It's easy to be blinded by the brilliance of new technology, but we need to tread lightly and remember to think for ourselves about the larger consequences of gene editing, especially as we all get older and closer to parenthood. So what do you think? How much should we use CRISPR to edit our children? If we can proceed with caution and commit to using this amazing technology in an ethical way, I believe that it has the power to do tremendous good and change the way that we deal with human suffering forever. Thank you.